So I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, this individual, Jose Domingo Gomez Rojas, but I'm going to be talking a lot about his friends and his comrades and his colleagues uh, from the time period as well. This is basically a book that I wrote with a very basic question in mind, which was why uh, did someone, a 24-year-old poet, a university student, uh, a clerk in a municipal office, uh, why is it that he died uh, in prison? Why did, well, he died in an asylum, but after two months in prison. So how did he go from basically spending time in cafes with colleagues and friends and, and, and organizers and others in, in Santiago, how did he go from that uh, into uh, the penitentiary, then to the jail, then to an asylum, then to a cemetery? Right? And so that was basically what I wanted to uh, make sense of. And uh, part of the reason I was interested in this project, or part of the reason I got interested in Gomez Rojas, um, there's a lot I could say about Gomez Rojas, but my particular interests were uh, twofold, maybe threefold. The first was uh, a long-standing interest in the politics of young people. Um, I remember a very particular moment that kind of brought this all home to me, which was in the 1990s, in 1999, the WTO, pro uh, WTO protests in Seattle, uh, in which I was really just completely appalled by the fact um, that reporters and media would come up to young people on the streets in Seattle and put a microphone in their face and say, why are you here? And if they didn't get like a 20 minute theoretically sophisticated exegesis that precisely analyzed why it was they were in the streets at that particular moment in time, they were somehow bored, bourgeois, middle class youth with nothing better to do. And it just drove me nuts. Um, and so I got very interested in, in trying to think about how I could write about young people and their politics and take their politics seriously without having to hew to, to, to some kind of purity ethos uh, that, that sometimes seems to run through talks about uh, political ideology. Um, the other reason I was uh, interested uh, in Gomez Rojas was because of his relationship to anarchist politics. Uh, and so I was quite interested in, in trying to revive uh, and, and to think through the ways in which uh, anarchist politics was much more vibrant, much more interesting, uh, than the kind of standard litany of things that you tend to get. Uh, you know, bomb throwers who are basically, you know, have no sense of solidarity with each other other than an act of committing violence. Or, again, the sort of idea of anarchists as uh, anti-theoretical, uh, that their only contribution to theory can, can be the dismissal of theory, right? And, and things like this. So I wanted to, um, to write about someone who identified as an anarchist, uh, but but was many things, as, as most people are. He was, like I said, a poet and, and, and a lot of other things as well. I didn't want to write a biography of Gomez Rojas. Uh, what I wanted to do was to try to reconstitute uh, the context in which his uh, persecution and death uh, took place. And that, made, that meant focusing very closely on his kind of environment, which was Santiago, Chile. Uh, so the other thing that was interesting for me in the book, because of my interest in geography and, and questions of space and, and spatial politics, was uh, a real effort to get at how, where people live, what the structure of a city is like, what the nature of the production is, uh, when the time period, what's happening in cities where people live, how does where they live impact their politics, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll show some maps uh, that, that relate to that. But I really wanted to focus in very closely on what the context of the city was like for him. So this is not a history of Chile, um, uh, in part because anarchists wouldn't want their history nationalized. <laughs> um, and it's also not a history of Chile because it's really focused in on Santiago very closely uh, uh, for very specific reasons. Having said that, it is a Chilean history because it would look very different if it took place in Buenos Aires or Mexico City, or New York, right? So it, it has, there's real specificity uh, that I want to get at, uh, but I don't want to sort of nationalize that specificity out. So very quickly, what happens? Uh, in 1920, uh, in July of 1920, there is a repression against people who are considered to be subversive. That means you are either a member of the Student University Federation called the Fetch, uh, which, is, uh, which is coming under significant critique at the time for reasons that I'll talk about in just a minute, or you are a member uh, of the, or perceived to be a member of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, otherwise known as the Wobblies. Neither of these organizations, neither the Fetch nor the IWW were proscribed. They were not illegal organizations until the 21st of July of 1920, right? And that's when uh, 
the, the sort of repression hits uh, full steam. And I'll talk a little bit about why that uh, repression uh, um, unfolded, just to give you some uh, sense of things. In, from 1891 uh, up until the mid-1920s, Chile was ruled was what, by what was known as the Parliamentary Republic. It was a weak executive, very strong parliament. It was a parliament composed of a very small core of basically sort of agricultural aristocrats uh, with some industrialists. Um, and <clears throat> in 1920, their rule was challenged by a kind of upstart uh, candidate named Arturo Alessandri, who was seen as a kind of pop populist uh, rabble rouser uh, in some form. Uh, this is taking place in the context of extraordinarily difficult structural circumstances, as many places in the world were experiencing after World War I, at the, in the last sort of end of the Great War, World War I, uh, massive inflation, massive social unrest, uh, uh, massive social insurgency in various places, Barcelona, uh, Peking, uh, Santiago, Buenos Aires, uh, parts of, many parts of the United States. Uh, and then also the impact of the Russian Revolution. Right? The Mexican Revolution is important too, but not to the people I study in Chile. They're really focused on the Russian Revolution. Uh, and that includes the elite as well. So this is a, a very uh, intense moment, and it's a moment that generates an enormous amount of anxiety uh, for people in power in Chile at the time. Uh, and the result is, is that uh, there's this uh, effort to kind of squeeze down very hard at a very particular moment. Okay, so. Gomez Rojas, he's the person that I'm really looking at quite closely, but I do it through, I look at him in the context of a group of his friends and colleagues. Uh, this is one of my favorite people that I've never met. Uh, Casimiro Barrios Fernandez, his name is not uh, correctly portrayed in the press. They call him Casimiro Ramos Fernandez, uh, but everybody knew who he was. Uh, he was very well known. Uh, this is a mugshot, uh, and it appeared in the newspaper, uh, one of the newspapers of the time period. Um, they knew who he was. You could probably tell why they knew who he was, in part because that is just the most lovely uh, kind of like mm, in your face, right? I mean, he's, that's a mugshot, and he's got a lot of attitude, and, and he's got a lot of attitude um, for a reason. He was very prominent and very well known. Uh, he was a Spanish um, immigrant. He came from Spain at the age of 14 came to Chile, moved to Santiago, married a woman from Chile, and had, had a number of children with her. He worked in a fabric store, uh, became close friends with Gomez Rojas through kind of circulating through cafe culture and, uh, and bars and, and, and places where people would share uh, poetry and things like this. Uh, but he was also very well known because he was an incredible organizer. Uh, and starting in 1918, he began organizing and was at the forefront of organizing with a, an organization known as the National Workers' Assembly on Nutrition. And they were pushing extraordinarily hard. This was a, a, a kind of cross-class organization. Uh, and they were pushing very hard to have things like no more taxes on the importation of Argentine beef so working people could afford small pieces of beef in their diets stopping uh, large agricultural interests from exporting cereals and basic foodstuffs at a time when, in fact, people were having an enormously difficult time coping with the cost of foodstuffs and not, and not being able to, to, to eat well uh, eat, uh, at all. So they were pushing really hard around basic questions of inflation, of food, of import, of export, and so forth. And Casimiro Barrios was at the forefront of organizing with the, with the Workers' uh, Assembly on uh, nutrition. He was also an enormous thorn in the side of employers who didn't abide by labor law. Uh, so there were certain rules on the books, uh, such as if you worked as a clerk in a, in a store, uh, every four hours you were allowed to have a 15-minute rest with a chair to sit down. It was called the, lay of the, the law of the chair. Uh, employers didn't, didn't fulfill those obligations. Uh, they didn't uh, close on Sundays when they were supposed to close on Sundays to give workers a day of rest. Uh, they would pay their workers in scrip rather than in wages, or they would ply them with alcohol. Right? Uh, he, was, he was one of the kind of straight-edge anarchists. Right? He was very opposed to alcohol. Uh, you'll meet some other anarchists who weren't, so you know, it's good. Um, so he was very well known. Uh, and, and because of his involvement in the Workers' Assembly uh, in, in November of 1918, uh, they put together a large demonstration in the streets of Santiago, 
And this is about 100,000 people that showed up to this demonstration in a city that was just over half a million at the time. It's an absolutely extraordinary uh, turnout. And it really shook the political foundations of the country and brought a lot of fear into the parliament and amongst the agriculturalists in particular who were targeted for uh, exporting and profiting at the expense of their own populace and so forth. So immediately after this, the president at the time uh, convinced the parliament to go ahead and draw back on things like taxes of Argentine beef and exports and so on and so forth. But they did something else as well, which is they passed a residency law basically saying that if you were subversive or undermining the social order, you would be expelled from the country. And lo and behold, the first person ordered expelled, he was not expelled initially, ordered expelled was Casimiro Barrios uh, one month later uh, in December of 1918. This gives you an example from the time period. This is uh, January 23rd of 1919, uh, and it's essentially um, an image that intersects precisely with the language and the ideas around the residency law. This is President San Fuentes. This is the Chilean flag. He's very rosy-cheeked, kind of St. George-like on the back of the horse, ready to slay with his patriotic lance what is essentially the most incredible amalgam of every possible piece of Orientalist prejudice you could put into one image, right? I mean, swarthy, beard, maximalismo, right? On an Ushanka, a Russian hat, but maximalism basically was like Bolshevik terrorist. It sort of put together Bolshevik and terrorist. Um, bombs in each hand, curved sword with blood on it, pistol, uh, scowl, um, and so on and so forth. And this is the la despedida, the send off, the goodbye, right? So this is the kind of image that was being generated at the time. Casimiro Barrios was sort of uh, uh, portrayed in some sense as a subversive um, in this way. The interesting thing was is that, of course, Casimiro Barrios was nothing like this. Uh, Casimiro Barrios was uh, instead a very good organizer, and that's what made him threatening. It wasn't really, uh, all of this other stuff was red herring distraction. The thing that made him so threatening was that he was not a transnational, peripatetic, moving around anarchist of the kind that most studies of anarchism tend to sort of suggest. You know, Enrico Malatesta, the famous anarchist who move from place to place to place and, and, and agitate people and then move on. He was like most anarchists, which is he was sedentary. He was in place and he, and he knew how to organize people and he knew whose doors to knock on. He knew who to go to to agitate for certain kinds of positions in the parliament and so on and so forth. And this is what made him threatening, really. Uh, and this just gives you an example here. This was you know, some map work that I did locating. This is where he lived. This is an area called the Barrio. So this is Santiago. Uh, this is, and this is a close-up here of this. And this is the area where he lived and worked. So here's his residence. Here's his workplace. This is Calle San Diego, which was a major thoroughfare. Um, but all of this uh, all of the things that I've identified here on this map are related to um, uh, the left uh, at the time. So you have the house of Jose Domingo Gomez Rojas, who's the, one of the core people that I write about in the book, as I mentioned. All of these little uh, black spots here are homes of people who would be arrested for being members of the IWW. Thirteen people in Santiago in one day were arrested. Eleven of them lived in this barrio Latino. Right? Socialist Workers' Party, which would become the Communist Party in 1922. Zapateria El Soviet, says it all. Uh, and uh, the IWW uh, local and the IWW center, the Woodworkers' Union, the Newman Print Shop. So this was Casimiro Barrios' world. Right? And this is, this is where he interacted and lived and moved and agitated uh, and so forth. And it's his experiences uh, and life in this barrio that essentially is what ultimately um, politicized him in many ways and led to his uh, uh, expulsion. So he's not expelled in 1918, uh, but he is expelled on July 19th of 1920, right? And right when we're getting to this moment now where I mentioned where there's the presidential elections, there's a populist sort of rabble rouser, uh, nerves are a little bit frayed, uh, there's a huge uh, out migration from nitrate mines in the north of Chile at this point in time. So it's a winter, right? July is winter in Chile. Uh, and there's uh, people coming in by the hundreds every day from the nitrate mines. Nitrate was the core of Chile's economy during World War I, and it collapsed at the end of the war for a number of different reasons, which I won't get into now. But what that meant was a huge out migration of people to Santiago, where they were housed in temporary encampments throughout the, the cities. Uh, and again, it led to a, a enormous concern amongst um, uh, the aristocracy of the city and the parliament and so forth about what 
what might uh, happen uh, because of this. So on July 19th, Barrios is expelled from the country to Peru. Right? Chile had a nice habit because they were in conflict with Peru. Uh, their habit was to expel their subversives to Peru. Right? Um, and then Peru would expel its subversives to Chile, and um, you know, they would do this to each other. The same day, July 19th of 1920, uh, as Casimiro Barrios is being expelled from, uh, from the country, uh, a group of people attack the Student Federation, the Fetch, its headquarters or its, its club. It's a club, you know, billiard tables, bar, barbershop, uh, library, and so forth, right downtown. And they come chanting that they're looking for the head of Juan Gandulfo. And this is Juan Gandulfo. Uh, Juan Gandulfo, uh, at the time, was a medical student uh, and a close friend, he would become a close friend of Pablo Neruda's. Uh, so when Pablo Neruda showed up in Chile about six months after a lot of the events that I'm narrating here unfolded, uh, he would become very good friends with Juan Gandulfo. Gandulfo would end up doing the engravings for the first edition of Pablo Neruda's first collection of poetry called Crepusculario. You have to go back to the first edition to actually see the engravings and to see that it was dedicated to Gandulfo by Neruda uh, because subsequent editions actually those things were extracted. Right? So Gandulfo is very interesting to me in part because he was one of the leaders of the Fetch, of the Student Federation in 1917, 1918, uh, and uh, 19, uh, 19. And he's, he's, a, he's a figure that's quite uh, remarkable. He, um, again, was also uh, a very active organizer. He was a member of the IWW. He was a colleague of Casimiro Barrios's. Uh, he was a medical student, but also organizing night schools, for example, for working people in the city, free uh, clinics uh, for working people in the city uh, as well. And what's interesting, just from my perspective here very briefly, and not to go into a lot of detail about Gandulfo, uh, what's interesting uh, for me is Gandulfo and the other leadership of the Fetch uh, took the Student Federation in a pretty sharp uh, direction starting in 1917 and 1918, and that is they began to forge alliances with working people uh, in uh, Santiago. These were, not, um, these were not always easy relationships that were forged. There was mutual suspicion. There was uh, occasional sort of paternalistic statements like, you know, we're the brains, you're the brawn, that kind of stuff. Uh, but in general, actually, they forged really remarkable, long-lasting relationships with working people to the degree that uh, striking unions, for example, workers in the department, very famous department store, the first sky, four, four story department store in Chile, Gati Chavez. Workers at Gati Chavez, when they decided to strike, when they had the vote on striking, they met in the offices, the club of the Fetch. Uh, it became a space where they actually found solidarity with students, but they also found a way to sort of at least briefly escape the eyes of police spies uh, and, and toads, uh, sapos, uh, infiltrators. Um, and so they began to forge these really uh, close relationships, right? So two things happened on July 19th that bring the sort of wrath uh, of the state and of other students down onto the heads of people like Juan Gandulfo and other students at the time. And that is, first of all, the student organization itself uh, made a very poignant public critique of, uh, of the Chilean economic system, the Chilean political system, and the fact that Chile was mobilizing troops, mobilizing troops on the border with uh, Peru. Uh, and Gandulfo was the kind of uh, outspoken one, uh, to say the least. He'd been in and out of prison multiple times. He was imprisoned at one point in March of 1920 for six days, where he was actually beaten by the police. Uh, and um, the reason he'd been arrested is because he'd given a speech in which he said, um, there's no way the president can solve uh, the social problems of the, uh, of the country because, uh, first of all, structurally, it wasn't possible for him because he was allied with the bourgeoisie, and secondly, because he had no brains anyway, right? So he'd you know, make these kind of public statements that were, that were uh, um, kind of uproarious and, and inflammatory, but also actually quite on point, um, and would end up being arrested and, and detained for a few days and roughed up and then, uh, and then let go. Uh, so there was, the, there was this critique that was being made. But the other, the other uh, reason that the Student Federation came under assault is because of these alliances that they were forging with working people, or at least this is what I, what I argue. This was a real breach of kind of social protocol and social boundaries. Uh, this was not something that had been uh, seen consistently or, or uh, frequently in the past. And these kinds of relationships being created and being forged were making uh, 
uh, people in the city nervous. The university itself uh, was opening up in the 19-teens, so what had been a university that was essentially designed in the 19th century to reproduce, I mean to forge, the, you know, to make the nation, right? Nations in Latin America were in part university projects uh, in some sense in, in the era of decolonization. Uh, but the other uh, thing universities were, was de were designed to do was to create the next sort of technocracy, right, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to run the country and so on and so forth. University, the University of Chile really begins to open up in the early 20th century. And what I mean by open up is, is that its numbers, the enrollment numbers go higher, uh, significant, significantly higher. Uh, they double over the course of about 15 years. And you get larger numbers of students enrolling in the university coming from the countryside, coming from the provinces, and coming from very modest backgrounds. Um, and when they come to the city, uh, they end up uh, living here. I'll show you a different image of this. Oh, I don't have it here. I'll, I'll come back to it. But they end up living in uh, areas of the city where they can find affordable housing, so boarding houses, pensions. And lo and behold, many of those were in places like the Barrio Latino, where Casimiro Barrios lived, or in the northern part of the city near the University of Chile's uh, medical school uh, at the time. These were both working class districts that were populated by anarchists, uh, members of the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, and, and others, right? So students themselves, where they're living, the streets they're walking down, the bars they're going to, uh, and so forth. Again, this is the environment that they're operating uh, within. And so the university itself is, is, is opening up in a different kind of way. It's becoming more political, more politicized. Students are reading about the Russian Revolution. Uh, in fact, uh, Gandulfo, when he wrote, he would call himself Ivan or Pravda. When Neruda wrote, uh, when he was a young man in newspapers, he would call himself Sachka Yegulev, after a character in a, in a short story by Leonid Andreev. So it's the Russians they're looking toward, right? It's the Russian Revolution, right? They're not naming themselves Emiliano Zapata, right? Um, or Pancho Villa or something like this. They're really focused on the Russian Revolution, uh, and they're reading about the Russian Revolution, but they're reading really eclectically. They're reading Max Stirner, who's the sort of arch-individualist anarchist, very Nietzschean, um, uh, and, and sort of, you know, the, the, the ego and I was the name of his book or something like that, uh, the ego. Um, and then, but they're also reading Bakunin and Kropotkin, they're reading Marx, they're reading Spengler, Oswald Spengler, who was a Russian conservative, um, Prussian, um, somewhat reactionary, but whose, whose works seemed very revolutionary to them because he was talking about the decline of Western civilization, by which he meant Europe and the United States. Um, so they're reading lots of stuff like this and they're organizing with working people and the, and the club is becoming this hotbed of activity uh, and this starts to make uh, a lot of people nervous, right, as all these other uh, uh, forces are kind of congealing and, and squeezing. So they come looking for the head of Juan Gandulfo. So here you can see, Trot this is Trotsky, right? So they're selling, it came out, only a, it came out in translation only a year after it was published in Russian. Uh, El mundo, the, the world will be maximalist or it will perish. Right, and so says Trotsky. <laughs> um, and so this is Trotsky's book, and a good friend of, of Juan Gandolfo's younger brother was, had these pamphlets on him because he was selling copies of this book uh, in advance as the, as the uh, um, translation was coming into Chile. He was selling it in advance for two pesos to those who might be uh, interested. And actually on the back of this pamphlet, there's all of his notations about who ordered uh, what. Right? So uh, just to give you an example there of the kinds of things they're reading. So there's an attack on the offices of the Fetch. This is not a very good image. Uh, the first attack on July 19th uh, forces Juan Gandulfo to go underground. Uh, and then uh, his brother, Pedro Gandulfo, and a few other students and writers uh, go to the offices of the Fetch to defend it. And two days later, there's a second attack. And this time, the attack is much larger. About 3,000 people uh, come to the office of the Fetch and basically lay waste to it. This is not a very good image, but you can see the size of the crowd. That's the main thing here. These, these are actually the offices up here. There's a balcony. Uh, but you can see the size, and then they engage in things like this. They throw portions of the library out the window, its archives, all kinds of stuff, uh, and burn it in the streets. And you can see the complicity of the police here, right? There's uh, police officers uh, here uh, watching as this uh, unfolds. Um, this is the kitchen that's been destroyed, the cantina uh, in the Fetch Club. Here's the, the pool table, which has been tipped over and trashed, uh, and so forth. 
Many of the people who attacked the offices of the Student Federation were other students. They were students from the Catholic University, which had been founded in 1888, and tended to be the place where, as the University of Chile, the public university, became more open, uh, and students were coming from, from a variety of backgrounds and so forth, the Catholic University was created in 1888 and tended to be more or less uh, populated by the, very well the children of the very well-to-do. Uh, and they uh, participated in the attack on the Student Federation, and they, what they did here is they pried off the, the planchas, the, the plaques that had actually been created by some craftspeople, uh, local craftsmen, artisans, uh, bronze plaques. They pried them off and sort of marched them around the city. And, you know, it's not just texting and, 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 uh, and, and selfies and stuff, that, right, that, that, you know, it's not a modern phenomenon. These guys were so foolish. They took these and they marched around the city with them and then they showed up at the offices of the major newspaper El Mercurio and posed for a photograph, right? And so, so eventually this will come back to haunt them uh, because eventually there will be an inquiry into who attacked the offices of the Fetch and, and destroyed all the uh, uh, furniture and so on and so forth. And of course, you have a who's who here of, of young aristocrats. So much so that someone's parents in a very smart moment jumped in and got the negative and erased the face, right? They scratched it out. So every, every uh, version of this image that I've seen, that, that face is scratched out. I can tell you about some of these people um, uh, later in the talk if you're interested. It's a, it is a very much a who's who of, uh, of, of young aristocracy. This is Pedro Gandulfo, Juan Gandulfo's brother. So there's the attack on the Fetch uh, on the 21st, um, and uh, Pedro Gandulfo uh, and others are detained, they're held, and they're sent to the Santiago jail. Uh, and that evening, um, many of the students who had attacked the student offices uh, marched up to the Plaza de Armas with flags and began to uh, force people in the plaza to kiss the flag as a show of patriotism, right? So a lot of this is about sort of patriotic uh, demonstrations and so forth. There was a scuffle with a young man who was a locksmith who didn't want to kiss the flag. Evidently, he'd participated in the attack on the fetch, so he wasn't anti-patriotic, but he didn't want to be told to kiss the flag when he didn't want to. There was a scuffle, uh, a gun went off, and uh, a young man uh, was shot and died. Um, and uh, the young man happened to be the son of a conservative senator, and there was enormous uproar. Uh, and there was an enormous uproar in the parliament uh, because, as one parliamentarian put it, I could imagine these things happening on the outskirts, but my God, downtown? Couldn't believe it, right? So, and of course, you can see exactly why. So this is a map that just, I took randomly 36 very notable uh, uh, members of high society uh, and mapped out where they lived. And this is downtown Santiago, right? So there's the University of Chile. Here's Calle San Diego. Down here's the Barrio Latino that I showed you earlier. North of the Mapocho is the other district where uh, students from out of town would live in pensions and boarding houses. Um, but here, you can see here, right? So here, right around the Plaza de Armas and in this section of what is called the Alameda. Uh, this is the main thoroughfare. And even if you go to Chile today, to Santiago, you'll see the, the old, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, large houses that were built, beautiful large houses that were built to line the, the uh, Alameda where the wealthy lived. Um, and so they still live downtown. And things like this, the attack on the student offices, then a shooting in the Plaza de Armas, these are things that, that uh, provoke enormous anxiety. Uh, and so they want this clamped down on. And so they immediately appoint a special prosecutor to investigate subversives. Uh, whatever that might mean. And of course, the language of subversion is very, very capacious, right? It's a big, uh, broad net, right? It, it allows you to kind of um, uh, excuse yourself for, for any overzealousness because it can, it can include so many uh, people, right? These are the kinds of things that were making uh, elite anxieties, uh, uh, generating elite anxieties. You get electrification of the city. So trams become electrified. So no longer are trams limited by, uh, by how much an animal can pull. It's no longer animal traction, it's electrical. So now you have double-decker trams that are just absolutely, you can see, jam-packed with people hanging off of the sides. Uh, in theory, the, the upper deck was, was the smoking deck. Um, I don't know if anybody's smoking here, it's just jam-packed, right? it's rush hour. Um, so people are uh, moving around the city with much more ease. Uh, tram fares are actually uh, 
even though the trams are expanding and, and the tram lines are expanding, tram fares are still actually quite low. There's lots of uh, argumentation and discussion around uh, how much the tram should cost. So you have working people now who used to be essentially kind of cast to the margins of the city. That's where a lot of the factories were, furniture factories, glass factories, things like this. Now they're moving around the city much more. They're, they're actually, they actually have some leisure time in the center of the city that used to be essentially the kind of public domain uh, of the private owning uh, class. Right? Uh, so that's worrisome. Things like this are worrisome. This is a picture that showed up in the newspaper in 1921 and the and this, um, the caption to it said, uh, a vagabond rad radical getting the latest on Lenin. <laughs> right? So they're worried about uh, people in public parks sitting around, like soaking up revolutionary manifestos and, and, and things like this. Uh, and so it, it's actually a very good indication of the kinds of anxieties that were uh, running through uh, uh, Santiago at the time. People would talk about... Uh, the old world virus of anarchism and the red flu, right, of Bolshevism. Um, so this is the person they appoint to go after so-called subversives, Jose Astorquiza. Uh, Astorquiza is a, a pretty interesting figure in the story of Gomez Rojas. Astorquiza is, um, I don't know, probably Pontius Pilate uh, and, uh, and Gomez Rojas is Jesus. Um, yeah, that's probably the best analogy. So, uh, so Astor Kisa is appointed. He's a very interesting man. I won't go into a lot of detail about him, but I did a lot of research on Astor Kisa because he has been cast as the kind of bad guy. Um, and what's interesting to me is he, he was in a situation of clear financial distress and, and, and was a, a bit of a social climber uh, and was getting squeezed pretty hard uh, to come down hard for forg and, and in return there would be forgiveness of his debts. And I don't have a smoking gun related to that, but there's a lot of indications that, in fact, that, that, was, uh, that was the case. And this is not to say that he uh, was somehow or another manipulated uh, or something like this. It's just to say that he, he's acting in a broader context that's important, and you can't let, you can't let the entire uh, apparatus within which he's operating off the hook. So he, would, he, he immediately began uh, to do a whole lot of work to find things like this. So he and the police, the, the security section, would go and raid people's homes or raid little uh, small apartments that people lived in in tenement houses and so forth, looking for stuff like this, evidence of membership in the IWW. So this is the Regional Administrative Council of the uh, IWW in, in uh, Chile. And interestingly enough, this had been uh, signed on the 15th of July of 1920, only, only six days prior uh, to the uh, uh, to the beginning of Astorquiza's um, um, persecutions. On the 25th of July, six days later, they engage in a huge roundup of people they believe associated with the IWW, and this is when Jose Domingo Gomez Rojas is going to be detained. So here's Gomez Rojas' house. All of the, the little black squares are police stations. Right? So these are the police stations around the city. This is the main police station, the public jail. Here's the Plaza de Armas that I mentioned earlier and the Club of the Fetch, University of Chile. But you can see the vast majority of people are down in that area called the Barrio uh, um, uh, Latino. Um, so they engage in a whole array of, uh, of picking people up uh, and so forth and detaining them. And very quickly, uh, by the end of July, you have a situation in which the public jail is overflowing with uh, what are essentially uh, political uh, prisoners. Right? Okay, I'll just move on a little bit here in the interest of time. So this brings us to, to Gomez Rojas, right? He's been detained in July. Uh, he's in the jail, uh, and the jail is, is overflowing as more and more people are being picked up. If you're protesting in the streets, you're arrested, uh, and so forth. And so a decision is made uh, to allow uh, prisoners in the jail to be moved to the penitentiary. And it's very interesting. The jail and the penitentiary are very different spaces. The jail is not a great space to be in. It's not designed to hold people on a permanent basis. The vast majority of people who moved through Santiago's jail, which could hold about, they had about 440 cells and could hold about 650 people at the time, uh, it was designed for drunk and disorderly conduct. And essentially, the vast majority of people who moved through are there because they're drunk. Um, so a lot of people are moved to the penitentiary. And the penitentiary is actually a little better of a space to be in. You can get natural light, you can go out onto the patio, you can smoke, you can hang out with your friends. And here's a good example of hanging out with your, your, your colleagues. Uh, and this is not unusual, by the way. I mean, you, you, uh, 
You find in Mexico in 1968, the, the, the phrase that people used in Mexico in 1968 during the repression against university students and academics was the best political science department in the country was a certain wing of the penitentiary, right? Where all the, all, all the sociologists and historians and political scientists had all been imprisoned together. So they actually had reading groups and they wrote together. And so they weren't held off in isolation from one another, they were put together. Here you see this, so here's Gomez Rojas. This is Pedro Gandulfo. This is a man I haven't had a chance to talk about, uh, but, but who's a really remarkable figure who I write about a lot in the book, Julio Valiente, a printer, and then a number of other of uh, both intellectuals and workers uh, together. There's, interestingly enough, there's 12 of them, they're sort of apostles of anarchism. Uh, the, the sort of religious stuff is interesting. So he gets moved to the penitentiary, uh, and then he's, he's uh, pulled into Astorquiza's office to be interrogated. And a very interesting uh, interchange happens between him and, and Astorquiza. Astorquiza says to him, um, are you an anarchist? And Gomez Rojas says, I don't have sufficient discipline to merit the title. Uh, and Astorquiza gets very unhappy and says, you know, do you realize that you are here under very serious charges or accusations, which is sedition, right? Um, and he shrugs his shoulders and he says, you know, let's not be so theatrical. Uh, and and Astorquiza gets enormously upset, has him taken out of the penitentiary and moved back to the jail and put into one of the cells in the basement of the jail where there's very little light in solitary confinement and on a diet of bread and water. And this is going to be the beginning of the end for Gomez Rojas. The press actually captured this exchange in some sense in this cartoon. Um, so, subversivo cree usted en, en el queso de bola. The queso de bola now means eat damn cheese, Dutch cheese, but at the time it's a reference to the shorn head of the judge, right? Essentially, do you believe in the law? Uh, and here you have a figure who's very Oscar Wilde, right? Uh, very flamboyant, um, uh, in, insolent is the word that gets used a lot. And, and part of the book argues for uh, understanding politically what insolence means and what, it, what happens to people for being insolent. So instead of being, you know, instead of practicing these kind of subverse, you know, these, these sort of subtle forms of resistance, people practice resistance where they, you know, they, they stand in front of you and they go like that uh, and they refuse. And so this was enormously infuriating uh, to Astorquiza and people who wanted social protocols to be followed. Uh, and so, you know, you have this figure here whose, whose posture and dress and hair, shoes, and so forth, uh, kind of reveal the exchange and, and the kind of perspectives that people had on it. So he's taken out of the penitentiary and he's taken back to the jail. Uh, and uh, in the jail, he begins to decline. He's, decline, uh, he's denied riding implements, he's uh, stripped of his clothing, he's shackled, uh, his diet is restricted, he's doused in uh, cold water repeatedly. Uh, and, and his condition deteriorates very quickly, and over the course of September, he's eventually moved to uh, the asylum in Santiago where he dies at the end of the month uh, of uh, September. Um, I think I'll probably stop there. I was gonna tell you a little bit about what happens to the figures here. I mean, Gandulfo uh, goes on to be an enormously important organizer in the 1920s. Uh, he founds a clinic, uh, a, a whole array of things, and I could talk in detail about him, but he dies, and. 1931 in a car accident. Casimiro Barrios uh, sneaks back into Chile in 1921. He's got a family there, his children are there. He comes back from Peru. He's then exiled again in 1927, but not for being an anarchist, but for being a communist. Uh, and he wouldn't have argued with that because in fact, uh, he named his son, born in 1925, Santiago Lenin Barrios. Um, but he's, he's, he's exiled, he's forced into exile for being a communist in 1927, goes to Bolivia where he organizes with anarchists. Right? And part of the point of the book is that these categories are very fluid. Uh, and this idea about, the, the retrospective idea about sectarian differences and so forth is really frustrating because it's just not how people lived it at, uh, at the time. Um, Pedro Gandulfo would uh, get tuberculosis. Many of the young men, they knew if they went to prison that 70% of them were gonna get tuberculosis. Uh, so they, they took real risks, right? This wasn't naive student politics. They were, make, they were taking very big risks. And he got tuberculosis and lived, lived with it for the rest of his life. Um, some of his children, I interviewed one of his uh, sons who lives in exile, was exiled during the coup of, of Pinochet. And there's a whole relationship between generations and political activism that I wanted to talk about too, that I talk about in the book. Last thing is, so here's, an here's, the, 
Here's the police document that took that old photo uh, where they, they shouldn't have had themselves photographed. Uh, and you can begin to see, right, they're identified. So on the back of this photograph is, you know, who's who in all of this list. And I'm just going to tell you very quickly a couple of things about some of these individuals. Um, many of them went on to study law. Uh, people that were arrested, like Pedro Gandufo, were denied their law degrees for being charged with sedition, even though they were not found guilty. Um, but interesting individuals. This man, Emilio Kartulovich, number seven, uh, was described as a sportman or a playboy. Uh, and he became famous in the early 1930s, late 1920s, early 1930s, for racing a sports car solo from Santiago to Buenos Aires across the Andes. And there's also been things that I've found uh, that suggest in 1934 he had a young lover who turned out to be later Eva Perón. Um, however, I will say this, which is that when I raised this with a friend of mine from Argentina, he said that's pure anti-Peronist propaganda. <laughs> so it's unclear, it's unclear if it was true or not. Um, but my friend who told me it was anti-Peronist propaganda told me after I published the book. And I was like, mm, uh-oh. But anyway. There's a, there's a couple of suggestions that that was indeed the case. This individual here, Benjamin Escobar, is wearing a mask. Uh, he was in the military school. He was a military cadet. Uh, and he would be one of three um, members of the Chilean military who would accompany the Nazi army on its invasion of Poland in 1939 as an observer. Right? And he would go on uh, to uh, uh, a career as part of the proto-fascist wing of the Chilean military that was quite prominent in the 40s. Uh, and uh, the 50s. I'm not trying to sort of, you know, guilt by association all of these people, but I want to give you some, some sense uh, of the trajectory, right, of the political uh, trajectory uh, that even in, by the 1970s and 1980s, uh, these things were still uh, alive, right? These trajectories follow families uh, in, in very powerful uh, ways in Chile, in ways that not necessarily happens in other uh, Places. And then last but not least, the contemporary student movement, the Chilean student movement today is enormously important. They're the ones pushing uh, politics in, in a way that nobody else is in Chile at this point, really. I mean, it's really remarkable since 2000, 2001, but really since 2006. Um, uh, the leadership, so the Fetch, the Student Federation, the leadership of the Fetch even today uh, is, is anarchist. That's what they call themselves. They refer to themselves as anarchists, Melissa Sepulveda and others. Uh, and this is a mural that they just painted in 2013 on the walls of their offices. Salvador Allende, Claridad, which was the uh, journal that the students created in 1921 in memory of Gomez Rojas. And there's Gomez Rojas. So I can talk about his poetry and a lot of other things, but I'll stop there and, and be happy to uh, answer questions. And thank you for, for listening. Yeah. And I'll leave that image up because it's a nice one. <laughs> so. Questions? Thanks so much, Ray. Um, so how old would um, Pinochet have been at this time? Um, Pinochet? Yeah. Uh, he would have been... Um, well, he was basically Allende's age. He would have been probably 16 or 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Around the time when he died. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, so Neruda showed up six months after Gomez Rojas' funeral. Gomez Rojas was 24, and uh, Neruda was born in 1904, so he was 17. Uh, so, and Allende was a couple of years later. So, yeah, 15, yeah, somewhere around 15. So he wasn't really a political force yet at that time? Uh, Pinochet? Pinochet, yeah. No, and, and Pinochet, um, you know, Pinochet, I, I, I don't mean this to sound mean, but I guess I'm not too worried about it. I mean, was a bit of a middling, you know, mediocre junior officer, right? I mean, he just, he had a very sort of nondescript career. Uh, he wasn't, um, I mean, you had uh, individuals who would go on to prominence in the political sphere who were already at a young age in the 1920s kind of quite intensely uh, engaged with things that were happening at the university, and that wasn't Pinochet's story. Mm -hmm. yeah. The yeah. other question I had is I hadn't, I, I'm not really familiar with nitrate mining. I know Chile is strong in uh, copper, yeah. rich in copper, but I wasn't familiar with nitrate. And was it different, like how it affected people? Or? Well, the nitrate mines, uh, you know, the, part of the reason for the conflicts between Chile and Peru had to do with Chile taking the northern uh, what was southern Peru and Bolivia at, uh, in a war in the 18, uh, late 1870s, early 1880s. 
And then subsequently, there were these nitrate discoveries. And so it was used you know, as, as fertilizer. I mean, it was really important to the Industrial Revolution in Europe. It was, it was important for armaments and weapons. What happened to the nitrate industry in part was German uh, scientists discovered a, or created a synthetic. Uh, and so there's a gradual decline in the nitrate industry. Copper, copper was important at the time, uh, but nitrates were, were the, the, the sort of gold uh, for a while. But by 1920, interestingly enough, um, fact, manufacturing uh, in Santiago employed more people than the nitrate mines did. Uh, and there was an enormous drop-off in nitrate production between 1917 and 1920. So it was used in fertilizer and armaments also? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Uh, sure. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. I was, uh, well, very interesting. Thank you very much. Ray. I was surprised by how uh, quickly the, the, the conservatives and how, I mean, violently the, the conservatives um, reacted so uh, here you have uh, it, the left that seems to be not uh, too violent, and then all of a sudden, immediately, this. So how and why, uh, which organizations were behind that were uh, behind this, this yeah. tremendous assault? Yeah, there's a lot of context behind this that I didn't get into. I mean, you mm. do have... Um, a sort of right-wing, uh, I don't want to call them paramilitaries, but kind of um, gangs, right? Patria y Libertad, right, uh, mm. is, is, a, is a very well-known one. But they're operating more in the north at that point. They're attacking Peruvians. One of the things I didn't talk about that, that's in the book a lot is, is the representation of Peruvians and the attacks on Peruvians, both in Santiago but also in the north. Um, so you have a, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty uh, volatile context generally, globally, but also within Chile. In the south, there are worker protests and demonstrations in the Magallanes, in the Straits, mm. amongst port workers. Um, and so part of it is that there's this mm. sense of, of turmoil more generally. In terms of things like a, um, uh, attacks and so forth, so something I didn't talk about that I go into detail in, in the book about is the police. You know, and the police are, um, no, nobody trusts the police, right? Uh, and they're in a real kind of image crisis in the 19-teens because there are bombs going off in Santiago and they're blaming it on the anarchists, but the proof is they're being planted by the police. Uh, and so, and the police are still in this kind of phase where the police chief in particular is employing uh, delinquents that are arrested and common criminals that are arrested to be part of the police force, right? This is a long-standing problem. So, you know, Les Mis by Victor Hugo, right? Jean Valjean and Jovert are based upon the same guy, right? They're based upon this guy, Vidoc, who was both a criminal who became an inspector. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that was happening is you had, uh, you know, people who were common criminals who were being pulled into the police force to kind of snitch and participate, but they were also quite uh, corrupt. And so, um, so you have, you, you have different kinds of violent acts happening in the city that are putting people on edge, but there's also this kind of mistrust of the police that's very uh, intense. The, the, the immediacy of the violence in July comes from mobiliz troop mobilizations, right? So the uh, parliament mobilizes troops on the border. There's a coup in Bolivia on July 12th, uh, and, uh, and immediately the idea is, is that this is a, an effort that Peru supported the coup as an effort to get back the northern territories where the nitrates are. Uh, and so Chile has to respond and mobilize for war. Right? And so this is, this is what happens. And so troops, reservists in the military, many of whom supported the opposition candidate, are put on trains and sent north uh, to the border with Peru. When the student movement responds and critiques this as as essentially a kind of distraction from what's happening with the elections, what's happening socially in the city, the economic crisis, and so forth, they're accused of being anti-patriotic, and there's this enormous upsurge. So people, in both instances, people are marching to the station to see the troops off, and then they march to the fetch and sort of vent their, their bile. Right? Uh, so that's part of the reason why you get this, you know, it's, it's just this real kind of intense moment. Yeah. No, because I was thinking that violence has been so pervasive all over Latin America, maybe with the exception of uh, Brazil to a certain extent. But this very, I mean, I'm thinking of Colombia, 
uh, in other countries that, I mean, both sides are very violent from the very beginning and the violence staying in the country for many, many years. So how mm. do you see that? Well, yeah, I don't know. I think the U.S. is pretty violent um, and has been for a long time, uh, especially, you know, anyway. Um, but I think, you know, I, I guess less than the violence, what's interesting to me, one way to respond to the question is that I, um, one of the things that was interesting to me about working on this project and uh, talking with some of the people that I interviewed and spent time with and so forth is just the need to recapture uh, moments like this so that, the f it, so that 1973 doesn't become fetishized as you know, Chile's illiberal moment, the, anonym the anomalous moment. It's not anomalous. Right? There were seven military coups in Chile in the 20th century. They were short, but there were seven military coups. And this is a very illiberal moment. Uh, and it sets a kind of precedent. And it's not surprising that, in fact, um, that in fact you can follow ge genealogies where someone's grandfather, right, who, someone, someone who's now on the left and someone who's now on the right, their grandfathers were on the right and the left and, and battling with each other 80 years ago. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, that's right. There are certain places where this holds and certain places where it doesn't. Yeah. Thanks so much for your talk. This was fascinating. So you, you mentioned that some of these guys are, they had this sort of, they were eclectically reading, right? And yeah. they're reading translations. So is, is there a story behind the translations? Are they locally produced? Are they being imported from Europe? Who, who are these guys? Are there losses and gains in translation as different contexts are being addressed from the origin text into yeah. to the hands of the readers? So they're, uh, um, you know, I can't answer entirely, you know, because it's not clear to me uh, in certain cases what, well, who's doing the translating, for example? Um, you can look at who, you know, who published the edition. So uh, they're reading a lot of stuff in the original French and in Spanish. Uh, the stuff in Russian uh, usually is being translated in Spain uh, and then making its way to Chile, sometimes in Argentina. They are exchanging um, texts. There's a wide circulation of texts amongst student movements. So. The, the Chilean student movement is, is quite different in many ways politically than what was unfolding in Argentina at the time and in Peru. Those movements are more kind of nationalist and pan-Latin Americanist, and, and you know, the Chilean Student Federation is much more internationalist. Um, but they are in communication with each other, exchanging books, exchanging journals, and things like that. They're also, you know, I should add, they're also reading a lot of kind of homegrown literature. Uh, so they are reading a lot of Gonzalez Prada, they're reading a lot of uh, Alberto Giraldo, they're reading uh, uh, Southern Cone uh, intellectuals um, as well. And so, you know, you know I want to make sure that doesn't get lost uh, as well. Uh, in terms of what gets lost in translation, yeah, hard to, um, hard to know for sure. And, um, and especially with the Russian uh, literature in particular. But most of the students um, that you know, that at least kind of make up the core of the student federation are all reading French. Uh, they're reading French and, and Spanish and a little bit of uh, English too, so yeah. thanks. I'm gonna be, indulge myself and claim the last question of the well, period, but first yeah. to also to let everyone know we have our friends from Buffalo Street Books here, and I expect if you would buy a book that mm -hmm. Professor Greb might be willing to sign it. I will be willing to sign it. Okay, yes. um, you mentioned that the university was expanding greatly in size and enrollment. Was that an act of parliament? Was it the university? Or what was the phenomenon around expanding the size of the university? Yeah. So it was a state uh, and still is a public institution. Uh, and part of this came from, there's an effort in, you know, starting in 1910 around the centenary of, uh, the centenary of, um, of independence. There's enormous investment being put into public works projects of various kinds, uh, efforts to kind of modernize the city, celebrate the centenary, and so forth. Um, and some of that actually is, um, serves as grist for Gomez Rojas's poetry. He's very critical of, of a lot of the expenditures. Uh, but the university is also part of that. This idea that the university uh, needed to move beyond just a, a small number of schools or faculties uh, and, and, and to expand more broadly. Um, it's also being, uh, there's also pressure from, from below uh, for that to happen. There's increasing uh, efforts on the part of, uh, of younger people and their families and a kind of growing middle class to have access 
uh, to university educations. And so you have, you know, it's, it's a middle class is a tricky word in this context, but you have people who, you know, they live much closer to poverty than they do to kind of moving up the social scale, but they're not, they're not working class people, right, at that point. The, the professional classes of um, attorneys, journalists, people who sort of inhabit the demi-monde of, of print culture and things like this. Uh, and, but they're, look, they're looking for access to education and they're pushing uh, to have the university expanded. Women are entering the university in significant numbers at this point in time. They're not a prominent um, part of the fetch and they're not a prominent part of the IWW, so this repression is almost entirely masculine. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty remarkable uh, vision that you get of, um, of how masculinized the Fetch and the IWW were. Um, so yeah, so that's what's happening with the university. Yeah, thank Great. You. Um, I think we can first thank Professor Crabb and then continue the conversation over cookies and at the Buffalo Street table. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.